Um, I'm a big fan of automation. So we'll look at using automation to make it easier uh, to have money available for expenses and savings. Um, and we'll also, so that's kind of like, how do we make it easy to have money available for the things that we want to spend money on or need to spend money on? Um, and then what are the flip side of that is how do we make it harder to spend money on stuff we don't really want to, maybe in the moment we want to spend it on, but in our big picture, we don't really want to spend money on it. Um, we'll look at some other things like eliminating recurring expenses that aren't needed. Um, and then we'll look at some more specifics, like how do you, some people find using envelopes really works well. So we'll talk about that. If you've heard about that, what is the envelope method? How do you do that? Um, we'll also, I mean, we'll spend most of today talking about spending, but towards the end, we'll do just a little bit on how do you, what are some simple ways to, to add to your take-home pay each month? Um, and we'll, we'll also talk about um, managing cash flow as a couple. So let's jump in and talk about uh, what are the different ways to make it easier to have money available for your necessary expenses and your savings. And as I've said, I'm a huge fan of automation. So we're basically gonna talk about three types of automation. So one is setting up automatic payments for debt and for other fixed expenses, setting up automatic monthly transfers to dedicated accounts to cover periodic expenses that come up. And those are the kinds of things that can really throw our our financial plans off track. So we'll talk about how to cover those expenses kind of regularly each month so that when a big expense comes up every six months or once a year, you have money available for it. And then we'll also talk about setting up automatic monthly transfers to add to your savings accounts. So let's dig into each of those in more depth. So the first one is setting up automatic uh, payments for your debt payments, your loan payments, and other fixed expenses. So these look like things like your credit card balance. Uh, I really recommend paying off the credit card balance in full every month with an automatic payment. Uh, loan payments, I really recommend having loan payments set up to automatically pull from your bank account every month. Uh, you can also pay utilities with automatic payments so that you don't have to remember paying them um, and that way you don't get any late fees um, and you can often set up things like rent uh, with your with an automatic payment so that's automatic uh, payments and then I had mentioned this I'm a fan of setting up automatic transfers to cover periodic expenses that can really throw your plan off track so these are things like insurance premiums, um, property taxes, and then even fun things like holiday gifts or vacations. Um, and what this looks like is, for example, for car insurance is kind of a common one. If you have, most of us pay our car insurance like every six months or once a year. So if you pay it every six months, let's say it's $600, when that bill comes due, the $600, that often throws off people's financial plans and they don't have enough money to pay it. Um, and they end up putting it, you know, having to take money on a credit card or something. If you think about it, though, that $600, it's $100 a month. So if you set up an automatic transfer every month that goes from your checking account to a dedicated savings account, that is your car insurance savings account. You've got $100 a month every month going into that car insurance savings account. And when the bill comes every six months, you've accumulated the $600 to pay it. So you can use that same strategy with all kinds of things. So it's insurance, premiums, or property taxes, but also if you, you know, want to be able to cover uh holiday gifts and you think, oh, I'd like to be able to spend, let's use $600 again, I'd like to be able to spend $600 on Christmas gifts this year. You can save $50 every month to a savings account that is called the gift account. And then when Christmas rolls around, you have $600 available. Um, 
So that I think there used to be something called like a Christmas club or something like that. It's the same idea, but you can set it up yourself for whatever expenses are, um, you know, to take a vacation every summer or whatever you want it to be. The next type of automation is to automate your savings because this is often the thing that gets left behind and that people end up not doing because it's not automated. So setting up an automatic transfer every month into a high yield savings account to build up your cash reserve so that you can build up to six months of expenses or your rainy day fund or emergency fund, whatever you want to call it. Um, setting up an automatic monthly transfer to fund uh, an IRA for your retirement accounts to fund uh, savings or your college savings. Um, you can also, uh, if you're trying to pay down your debt faster, excess debt payments above the minimum required counts as additional savings. So if you're trying to pay down your debt faster, you might want to add an automatic additional $100 a month that goes onto your debt payment. Um, and again, last item here, I've already said it a few times, our goal is to get to 20% of your take-home pay going to savings. But if you can only start out with 1%, that's wonderful. And then you, you can build up gradually. So um, those were things we that we talked about how do you make it easier to have money available for expenses that you want to cover. The flip side is uh, how do you make it harder to spend money on stuff you really don't need or that is really sabotaging your spending. So we're going to talk about a number of things you can do, different uh, techniques and strategies um, for how to reduce your spending. So there's mindfulness uh, things you can do, just kind of delay tactics you can use. Um, you can set yourself up to make sure you're actually using what you purchase and requiring yourself to use what you purchase. Um, you can also plan out what you're purchasing. And we'll talk at the very end about eliminating some of those recurring charges that really tend to uh, knock off your spending plan. So let's talk about each of these in more detail. The first one is mindfulness techniques to reduce spending. So the whole point of this is just to make yourself aware of what you're spending, because oftentimes we're just kind of spending money and we are completely, we're not aware of how much we're spending. So an easy way to do this is to switch to using cash or a debit card. And that has been proven over and over to really reduce how much people are spending because it makes you painfully aware of what you're spending each day. Um, you can also, I always recommend reviewing your bank balance daily, whether that's at the end of the day to see what you spent for the day or the start of the day to see what you spent the day before. Um, if you're using a credit card, similarly, look at your credit card. You know, we you can get an app on your phone now where you can really look at what did I spend on my credit card today or yesterday? It's all to just make you aware of what you're spending because all of these things will reduce your spending. Those are mindfulness techniques. Uh, the next thing are these are different delay tactics and these tend to work best for online purchases, which a lot of people uh, end up sending stuff online that they uh, more than they want to. So um, I always recommend waiting 24 hours before making a purchase. Uh, I recommend eliminating the one click to buy button that many sites have and uh, also eliminating the autofill of your credit card information and your address. You want to make it you want to make it as hard as possible to purchase something online. So you want to um, have to enter in your credit card information. You want to have to enter in your address every single time because it will reduce how much you're spending. Um, next is um, looking at uh, setting yourself up so that you actually use what you buy because many people don't end up using what they buy. And so that's really a waste of money and, as well as resources. Um, 
So just first of all, looking at the stuff you already have at home, look through your closets and cupboards, whatever stuff you have in there, make sure you're using it um, before you go to buy something. Again, look in your closets and cupboards. Is there something you already own that you could use instead of what you're thinking about buying? Um, and for new items that you do buy, if you haven't used them within a month, return them. That's, it means you probably don't really need it if you haven't used it. Um, and then when you're looking at buying new stuff, really work on buying new stuff that you're going to use in the next one to two weeks. So not buying stuff that, well, oh, this might come in handy because that tends to be the stuff you end up never using. Um, so like with groceries, it really should be when you buy groceries, you're going to use them in the, new, in the next week. For non-groceries, when you buy stuff, it really should be used within the next one to two weeks. So when you buy stuff, bring it home, unwrap it, start using it. Uh, there's going to be exceptions to this. So I, I, I put an example in here. For example, if you're going to a wedding and you need a special outfit, probably better to not wait uh, until the week before to buy it. Better to buy that, you know, a month in advance. Uh, but for most other stuff, it really should be if you're buying something, it's because you're actually going to use it soon. Um, the same for services, right? So if you buy a gym membership, you should be using it immediately. It shouldn't be like, well, if I buy it, then I'm probably going to use it. Like, no, you should buy it and then use it immediately. Um, and again, there will be exceptions. Again, to use the, uh, the idea of this wedding, if you have to buy a plane ticket to go to a wedding, much better to buy that two or three months in advance. Because if you wait and buy it the week or two before, you're going to probably spend more money on it. Um, and then I do recommend sort of planning out how you're going to spend your money. So for specific things like there's great uh, websites around how to plan meals, which has been really proven to reduce your spending on groceries. I give you one of the sites there that I like. You can also plan out your clothes uh, wardrobe uh and there are a couple of sites here, uh, and that, again, is proven to reduce the amount of money you spend on your clothes as if you're really planning out what you're going to wear and how you're going to wear it. Um, the last thing about making it harder to spend money is looking at some of these recurring charges that you maybe are not fully using. So I mentioned the gym. That seems to be a common one. Uh, cable phone apps, streaming services, people tend to have a lot of these things and they're not, they're not using them at all, or they're not really, they're not using them much. Um, Amazon Prime Costco membership. Good. I'm in the program right now. Yeah. Um, storage units. A lot of people have storage units that they don't really need and they just keep paying every month. A non-essential car. So a lot of, sometimes people will have a second car that they're not really using when they're part of a couple and they could really save a lot of money by going down to one car. And then I listed some things about bank fees and credit card fees. So banks and credit cards often charge, you know, ATM fees, monthly fees, annual fees, late charges, foreign transaction fees, all of these things where, um, you're not really getting any value of it. So if you can root those things out and eliminate them, it, it puts more money in your bank account. Um, so those were, I just talked about, those are all kinds of things that are more like guardrails to guide your spending. And those things alone often will reduce your spending to a manageable level. Sometimes people, it's that's just not enough, and they're looking for a more specific way to control their spending, and that's when the envelope method really comes in handy. So the envelope method is a very old method of, um, it's basically paying for cash with everything, and you take, you calculate out what is, what is my monthly take-home pay, and you subtract out how much has to go to rent and other fixed expenses, subtract out what you want to go to savings, put that in a savings account. And then whatever cash you have left is your cash to spend for the month. That's your what we've been talking about, this discretionary amount of spending. That goes in an envelope, and that's the money you spend 
for the month. And when the money's gone, you're done spending. Um, you can do variations on that rather than breaking it up for an entire month. You can break it up and have a certain amount to spend every week. Sometimes that's easier. Or you can break it down and say, okay, I'm going to have this much to spend on groceries and this much to spend on everything else or however you want to do it. There's different ways to do that. Um, if you don't want to use cash, you can do a, a slightly more modern version of this and have a dedicated bank account that's your discretionary spending account. And you do that same calculation, like your take-home pay minus fixed expenses, you know, your necessary expenses minus savings to get your discretionary spending amount. That goes in a set bank account. You have a debit card that is attached to that bank account. You use that debit card to spend for the month. And again, when that money is gone from that account, that's the end of your spending for the month. Um, there are uh, digital ways to kind of do an envelope method. So there's an app called Good Budget, which allows you kind of on your phone to set up digital envelopes. There's also some banks offer digital envelopes. I know Ally has a thing called Spending Buckets and other banks have something similar that are basically digital envelopes. You can also try to set it up in a spreadsheet like Google Sheets or Excel, just a way to have an, uh, digital envelopes to kind of plan, plan out and track your spending. Um, so those are kind of the, those are ways to kind of get your spending to the level that you want it to be. And then I had said we would talk about, is there just some simple things you can do to increase your take-home pay? each month. So I think you hear this term of passive income. So just some things you can uh, sign up for services like Rakuten that gives you cash rebates when you make purchases at uh, a number of stores. You can earn more interest on your cash by using a high yield savings account. Uh, many there are many online high yield savings accounts. There's Ally, there's CIT, there's Synchrony, there's many others. Um, you can get a credit card uh, that doesn't have an annual fee and, it, and will give you cash back of 1% to 2% on your purchases. Um, you can sign up for uh, shopping apps like Capital One that give you discounts, um, reduce prices on the things that you buy. And the last one I listed was just you can... One way to add money into your bank account is by reducing uh, legally the amount you pay in taxes. And one way to do that is with, um, there's like health savings accounts that basically lets you pay for medical expenses with pre-tax dollars. And then there's dependent care accounts that lets you pay for child care expenses with pre-tax dollars. So that saves you on taxes. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is for those of you who are, have joint finances, you're part of a couple, um, what's the best way for you to kind of manage your finances as a couple? So a couple things here. I recommend you have a set time each month where you sit down together and talk about your finances. So schedule an hour, get some coffee, definitely make it during the day, not at night when you're tired. So in the morning or at lunchtime or whatever, and just review what you spent over the last month and review what's coming up in the next month for spending. Uh, this is also a time for you to reconfirm your priorities for what you want to spend money on, it, both individually and together. What are the priorities that you want to spend on for that for the next month and for the rest of the year? Um, as part of this, in addition to these monthly meetings, I recommend an annual meeting where you sit down, you review statements from all of your accounts, um, all your policies. It's a great time to sort of tally up your assets and your debts and get an idea of what your net worth is and kind of track that each year. Um, and I do recommend you take turns sort of as being the one who's kind of in charge of the day-to-day -day financial stuff. So um, maybe each of you takes a year or each of you takes two to three years and then you rotate, like who's in charge of whether it's balancing the checkbook or that type of stuff, entering things online, 
so that you each are very aware of what your joint financial situation is. Um, so that's kind of the things that I wanted to talk about today before we wrap up and we have time for questions. I just, I want to leave you with one, one thought. Um, how you spend money shows what's important to you. So spend with a purpose on the stuff that actually matters to you and don't let uh, your money sort of dribble through your hands because you're not really paying attention to it or you're not making a conscious decision of what you want to spend money on. Um, that's the end of my presentation. We do have time for any questions. So please let me know what questions you have. Yes. Yeah, so if you have any questions, please write your questions into the chat. Or um, if you want, you can raise your hand and I'll um, ask you to unmute. Um, I think we have one question here in the chat already. Um, so Gina says, I'd love to know how to do this when paid by monthly. And um, for clarification, uh, say I have a bunch of fixed expenses and I get paid twice per month. How do I set aside money for specific bills at specific times of the month? Okay, that's a great question. So that's pretty common, right? A lot of people get paid um, twice a month. So you just have to look at your paycheck, whatever that is, times two, that's your money for the month. And then it's just the same thing. Like if you're, um, you're, I always like to use really simple numbers. So I'm going to use very simple numbers. If you get paid um, $2,000 each paycheck, that's your take home. Then it's $4,000 for the month. And so you would say, and I know no one gets paid precisely $2,000 a paycheck, but to use simple numbers. So, okay, your take home pay is $4,000 for the month. And then you look at, okay, how, what is my rent? I gotta subtract that out. I gotta ideally set that up to get paid automatically. Any debt payments you have, utilities, make sure those are all paid automatically set up a high yield savings account and if your take home pay is 4000 a month start you know start out with what you can right ideally it would be $400 a month would go into that high yield savings account but if you start out with 200 or even 100 whatever it is start that out um you can if you're worried about the um getting paid twice a month, you can rather than doing stuff once a month, you could set it up to do things twice a month, right? So whatever those numbers are, cutting them in half and having it and having it get paid twice a month. Okay. Kay asks, is uh, Rakuten safe? What are the downsides of using this? It, it is safe. I, it's, um, I use it myself. I, um, I, I don't actually, I can't think of a downside, honestly. I, I've researched it and it is safe. And Gina, I had to move a few uh, due dates around, so I wasn't in debt at the end of the month. Um, yeah. Okay, and Robert has a comment, I think. Um, this is basically what many refer to as financial literacy, who should be responsible for the financial literacy of children, the church, the family, or should the burden be imposed on schools? Um, I, I don't know. I feel like that's out of my, uh, my, out of my area of expertise. Yeah. I feel, um, Lisa asks, what do you do if your income doesn't cover the 50, 20, 30? Sorry, whatever the breakdown was. Yeah. Um, so that is, that's where I'm saying uh, that's the ideal, right? I feel like in life, it's always kind of good to have the goal, the ideal that we're working towards. Um, but I think for most people, it's not, they're not going to have that ideal, certainly not when they start. So you just try to get as close as possible. And so that's where I was saying with savings, even if you just do 1% the first month, it, it's just getting in that habit of 
shaving off a little bit and saving, and then you'll, over time, likely you'll be able to save a little bit more. So you're really just, your goal is to get to that 20% of savings, but start out with 1% and then build from there. Um, Beverly sent us a direct, me a direct message, but um, uh, thank you for this very detailed presentation. So that's a oh, nice thank you. Thank you, uh -huh. thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Sewell, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but why 50, 30, 20 versus another ratio? Oh, that's such a great question. I actually don't know exactly. I just know it is... Uh, a commonly accepted ratio that many financial advisors use. There's been a lot of research done on it and um, it's just been proven to work over and over. I think the original thinking behind it was that if you were part of a couple, you could live, if you had to, you could live off of one paycheck because your necessary expenses are only 50% of your take-home pay. So that if something happened and one of you lost your job, you could for a while live off of one paycheck on the 50% of necessary expenses. Um, it's just, I've also found in my practice, just once you're, whether you're in a couple or not, once your expenses, your necessary expenses get over 50% of your take home pay, that, that it becomes very stressful because you don't really have much left over for fun stuff or for savings. And so you, you always just kind of feel like you're behind. You're always trying to catch up. Okay. Gina asks, does anyone have a spreadsheet that they can share that I can plug in amounts to and that will automatically cal calculate your daily ending balance? The daily ending balance of your bank account? Um, I know that uh, some banks do that. I know Ally Bank does something like that. If you want a, um, this is actually a great, question. I'm going to remember this to add uh, to, to my future presentation. Um, Nerd Wallet, Nerd Wallet has, if you know that site, they have a 50, 30, 20 uh, template budget. And that might be what you're looking for. Check that out first. Sue Ann. Uh, so what are some high yield savings accounts with no minimums that you recommend? So um, I had listed a couple in the presentation. There's Ally. Um, I've mentioned Ally Bank a few times. There's CIT is another great one. Uh, Synchrony has one. Um, th there's many out there, but those those three I've used before and I like them. Gina asks, um, so if I get paid by monthly and my car payment is 400, but I don't have enough to cover that payment in my second pay period, should I set aside money from the first pay period to float over to the second pay period? Yes, that would work. That would work. And I think what the goal is, is that ultimately you get to the point where you have enough money at the end of the month to cover expenses for the next month so that you don't have to do this like okay I've got to I've got to time my payments on when my paychecks come in you've already got enough at the end of one month to cover you for the next month so Beverly um, states, I just started going out to museums, restaurants, amusement parks, etc. I noticed that I like to shop at the museum shops. Any tips on how to curb impulse buying on the spot? I went to Disneyland two years ago. I gave myself an advance permission to buy a maximum of two nonprofit items for under $30. I have a harder time restraining myself in museum shops. I mean, if you know that's your weakness, uh a couple of things. One, don't go in the shop. I mean, that would be the like really hardcore one. Um, and two would be um, don't take 
don't uh, don't take cash with you and make yourself pay for it with cash. Or if you're trying to set a limit, take thirty dollars in cash with you, and that's what you can spend it on. That's all you can spend. Gina asks, "I'm wondering what kind what kinds of credit cards to look for that will create passive income. Do you have any resources for financial anxiety?" I guess this is two questions. I'm trying to keep at least 1,000 in my account, which would equal zero, basically. Okay. Um, for credit cards, there, yeah, if you just get one that has um, no annual fee, I know that Capital One has a couple of good ones that have no annual fee, there's no foreign transaction fees, and they will pay you. 1% back or 1.5% back on all your purchases. And for financial anxiety, I don't actually know off the top of my head. Sorry. Okay. Robert is recommending Gina use Excel. Um, yeah, great resource if you want to create a budget. Um. Marianne has joined the um, joined the museum. Then you usually get ten to fifteen percent discount. Um, okay, so Penny has a comment. I wish I had this information before a health condition occurred, which would reduce my ability to earn. I started acquiring debt. I guess now is better than never. So thank you for this class. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, now is better than never, right? I think all of us, all of us with many things think, oh, if only I'd done this, right? Or I wish I'd done it sooner. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, it would have been better to do it sooner, but it's much better to do it now than a year from now or two years from now. Mary um, um, says Capital One is great. Um, yes. And Kay is recommending Budget Mom on YouTube. Does great videos showing her cash envelope system. Oh, okay. Okay, so those are all the questions in the chat so far. Um, uh, if anybody would like to unmute, I, you could just raise your hand. If um, you don't want to write in the chat, you can go ahead and, and ask your question. Just make sure to raise your hand so I can un ask you to unmute. Okay, and Robert also is um, giving some words of encouragement. Indeed, we can still adopt strategies regardless of where we are in life. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And has has anybody tried to raise their hand and can't? Let me know in the chat. Okay, Gina asks, or um, my employer offers a HSA and flex spending account. My employer also matches what I save. Um, oops. What I save, can you explain the difference between the two? Does uh, HSA save me money for the future for when I'm older? Yeah, so the difference between those two is um, an FSA, the flexible spending account, you choose um, before January how much you're going to save out of your paycheck for the following calendar year. So like this last December or November, you would have said, oh, um, starting in January, I'm going to save $50 a paycheck into the FSA. Um, and then that money must be spent on eligible medical expenses before the end of this 
year. And if you, uh, sometimes it'll extend until March, but it's meant for this year. And if you don't spend that money in this calendar year, you lose that money. So those are, those to me are, are too restrictive. I mean, I, if that's all you have available to you and you know, like you, like I get, I wear contacts. So I know every year I have to buy a certain amount of contacts. I know exactly how much it costs. Then I feel comfortable putting that much in an FSA. But other than that, I don't want to put too much in it because if I'm lucky and I don't have a lot of medical expenses in one year, I lose the money. The HSA is, well, first of all, you can put more money into it. And second of all, there's just a lot of flexibility. If you want to and you and you have medical expenses this year, you can use it all in this year. If you are lucky and don't have medical, a lot of medical expenses this year, it can roll over to the next year and the next year and the next year. And I think what you might have been referring to is that um, ultimately, once you are retired, so past, um, I don't know if it's 59 and a half or 65, but it's meant for retirement, you can use the money in the HSA even if you don't use it for medical expenses. So it, it is a, an additional way to save for retirement. Robert, uh, responding to Gina, said, SFPL probably has introductory Excel courses. Yes, we do have a lot of resources. We have a lot of books on Excel. Um, so please look for those in our catalog. Um, as far as a program, I'm not aware of one that's happening um, anytime soon. But I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the chat. And that's a link to our survey, and it asks what kind of programming you would like. So if you would like an Excel program, please please write that into the suggestions, and we will um, look into creating um, that program. So, And we always appreciate that type of feedback. Um, so the survey is in the chat now. So Kay um, says, I keep my separate, I keep many separate sinking funds, but it gets messy when I have to shift money between them due to unexpected expenses. Any recommendations how to simplify or streamline for this type of situation? Yeah, I mean, I think you can, it's trial by error sometimes. It's true. You can end up with too many, I love calling them sinking funds, um, too many dedicated accounts for specific purposes right so it, it some people really like that and for other people it's too much so it sounds like you figured out it's too much for you so maybe it would be better than to have just a couple maybe broader categories so you always want to have your like the cash reserve or the rainy day emergency fund you want to have that but maybe then you just have a couple I don't know how many different specific accounts you have, but maybe then you just have a couple, like one is for insurance payments. So all insurance payments. So not just car insurance, but also for like car insurance, house insurance, renter's insurance, whatever, that all insurance payments. Um, another broad category would be like, uh, fun goals, whether that's, you know, gifts or travel or whatever. So you might want to think about it like that. I also think this idea of having digital envelopes maybe would get at that. So rather than having actual accounts that have different purposes, um, you can use digital envelopes, whether that's with the Good Budget app or with a bank like Ally, where you can have digital envelopes or spending buckets, whatever you want to call it. You don't then have multiple accounts. You just have one account, but it is divvied up digitally into different purposes. Beverly states, I currently carry a high balance on a credit card and I do not pay the minimum. I double the minimum and add the interest, and that's what I pay. I still save 10 to 20% of my uh, each month. Should I still continue to put money in savings, even though the interest rate on the credit card is much higher than what my savings account earns? I am retired. Um, you would be 
better off paying off the credit card debt because you're probably paying much more on the credit card debt than you're earning in your savings account. So you would be better off getting rid of as much of the debt as possible. Okay, so Gina asks for um, another question regarding H HSA. Then the HSA is what the employer matches. So say I set aside 200 for my H HSA, that's what I will see when I'm like 75 and retired, right? If you don't spend it before then. Also, depending on the HSA, you're, you're going to be earning interest or some other, you can invest it in different ways. So if that's really what you're planning on is that it's a retirement instrument, then you would want to be investing that and not just having it sit in the savings account portion of the HSA account. Okay, there's a few questions about the slides being available after the presentation. Um, the recording will be available, and I will send that out um, on Tuesday uh, or later on, in, either later this evening or on Tuesday. Um, it's a, It would be a link with the password to this recording for, for all participants. Um, Gina, I'd love to give someone my passwords and account info to just streamline everything for me. Does a person like that exist? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, and I'd be very careful as well, yeah. just because of fraud and you don't want people to, to have that information. Um, Beverly, I prep I prep registered for this class. Will I automatically be, yes, you'll be emailed the recording. Um, Gina, what are common fixed expense categories? Um, for example, would you recommend I make a category dog if my um, dog has health insurance and dog food and dog walking fees, et cetera, or bulk her insurance in with mine? I'm just, I'm asking just for organizing purposes. Yeah, I mean, I think those dog expenses are fixed, right? If you're paying, I would consider that the dot the pet insurance is another insurance payment. So that's a fixed expense every month. I think well, I have a dog, so I'm thinking about my wonderful dog. Um, I think most of us with dogs, there is a set amount we spend on food every month. So you kind of know that that's what it is. And if you do have a dog walker you know, like, you know, in order to go to work, you, that you've got to have the dog walker however many days a week um, that you go to work. So yes, that's a fixed expense. So Monty says, uh, getsetup.io has free courses geared mostly to seniors, but anybody can watch them like Microsoft Office Basics. They're mostly pre-recorded and seem like a Zoom format, but you can watch all of their courses anytime. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Monty. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's all the questions in the chat. Um, okay. Nobody has raised their hand so far. Um, so it looks like we've gotten to everybody's questions. Of course, if you um, reach out to, to the Business Science and Technology Center, we can follow up on any questions that... Um, that uh, that you need answer that you're asking. And uh, so, uh, yeah, reach out, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And so just one more, uh, Beverly says, do you recommend I lower the amount I put in savings from 10, 20 to two to three of my monthly pension? I want to continue saving. Um. Is this going back to the debt payments? I guess so. She's the uh, okay. Beverly's the first person to unmute uh, to raise their hand, so I'll ask oh, okay. them to unmute. Unmute, yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead, Beverly. Hi. Um, I I live in a house that was built in 1906, so I have a lot of repairs, and I often and things that I can't put up. So I don't want to use my credit card. I haven't used my credit card in several years, except for like small, uh, like coffee or something. I've been told it's a good idea to use it periodically. 
I already set what I pay on the card. Um, I'm a, uh, I have a pension, but I currently save 10 to 20 percent of that pension um, monthly. I forgot to put the percent size signs. I'm not a good typist, and so it sounds weird when you read it. Thank you for reading it for me. So I save 10 to 20 percent. Um, but I'm wondering if you recommend, you said we could save one to 2%. You recommend I slice the amount that I currently save for my pension, which is 10 to 20% to one to 2% and, and use the balance towards a savings account. I mean, towards paying off the credit card. I'm just afraid if, I think we should still continue. I sh should I still continue to put money in savings? even though I have a, a, a balance um, on my credit card? That's my main uh, question. So I think that would be fine. You could put 1% into savings and redirect the rest to paying off the credit card debt okay. because the credit card debt is costing you so okay. much more than what you're earning in the savings account. Okay, but still put something in savings, right? So that I'm not just relying on the credit card if something happens. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. You're welcome.